Welcome to Women in the Music Industry, the podcast that shines a spotlight on the remarkable women who are breaking barriers and making their mark in an industry that has long been dominated by men. I'm your host, Rob Wells, and I'm thrilled to have you join us on this empowering journey. Each episode of this podcast will be dedicated to exploring the inspiring stories, accomplishments, and struggles of the extraordinary women who have defied the odds and made waves in the music business. Together, we'll delve into the journeys of female artists, songwriters, producers, musicians, managers, executives, and all those who have helped play a pivotal role behind the scenes. We'll uncover the stories that deserve to be heard, as well as celebrate the triumphs, challenges, and unique perspectives that women bring to the music industry. Whether you're a fan of music, an aspiring artist, or simply curious about the inner workings of the music business, this podcast will offer a valuable perspective. Together, we'll celebrate the power of music and the strength of these inspiring women. So join us as we amplify their voices and together pave the way for a future where women in the music business are no longer the exception, but the rule. Today's podcast is sponsored by The Songwriter's Piano, an easy-to-use app for songwriters and lyricists to use when coming up with song ideas when there's no instrument around or nobody to play one. With The Songwriter's Piano, one can easily play commonly used pop songwriting chord sequences at the touch of a screen, in any key, in three different chord variations, all played on a gorgeously recorded grand piano. Download The Songwriter's Piano by Play Like Me apps today, found on both iOS and Android stores everywhere. Welcome everyone to the second episode of Women in the Music Industry. For those of you who are just joining us for the first time, welcome. For those that are returning, welcome as well. And I am so looking forward to this episode as this features one of my favorite people in the music industry, Kim Temple. Uh, Before we dive in, I'd like to give you some background information on Kim. Uh, Get ready for this. This is pretty heavy. Kim is a Juno-nominated musician who wears a few different hats in the Canadian music industry. She is head of the publishing and sync division at Six Shooter Records, a 23-year-old women-owned and women-led company based in Toronto. She is president of High Priestess Publishing, a joint venture created in partnership with Six Shooter, whose core values are firmly aligned with those of the LGBTQ2S plus and racialized artist communities. Kim is also the Senior Manager of Programming and Industry Relations at Music Publishers Canada, which is the nonprofit National Trade Association for Music Publishers. In her role there, she oversees the Women in the Studio National Accelerator, designed to support and uplift female-identifying, non-binary, and gender-fluid producer-songwriters. She also leads international song camps and B2B trade missions in key export territories. If this wasn't enough, it keeps going. Uh, She currently sits on the Music Advisory Committee for the City of Toronto and Ontario Creates. Earlier this month, she was presented with not one, but two awards at the Guild of Music Supervisors Sync Awards, Best Indie Label Sync Team and Sync Artist of the Year for Tanya Tagak. She is also an incredible human being and is kind to a fault. I am incredibly honored that she said yes to doing this podcast and video series. And it is my absolute pleasure to welcome to the Women in the Music Industry podcast, Kim Temple. How are you? I'm pretty good. Thank you for inviting me to do this. If it had been anybody else, I absolutely would have shied away and recoiled and said, no, thank you. (laughs) Because it was you. Uh, You know, I, I love having conversations with you. So I was like, yeah, let's do this. Yeah, likewise. It's so easy. I, I feel like, I, honestly, I feel like I'm not worthy of this because I, I, you're just like, you do so much in the music industry. And I feel like I just do like this tiny little piece of the music industry. And I'm just like struggling to just even understand fully everything that you do. And just like, I, I just feel like I'm sitting back and I, I'm just going to have a lesson from the master right now as to everything that you do. And I'm so interested to to know about you further uh, and, and know about how you got from point A to point B, but that's what this whole uh, podcast is about. And also to inspire future generations to uh, join forces in the music industry with other people and and see that there is a a possibility and a future to actually have a great career in the music industry. So, so thankful that you're here. Um, 
I guess we can get right into it. I know your time is limited. Uh, I want to know just more about you first and foremost, just when did you discover a love of music? How early on in your, in your life was it that you really? I'm going to guess it was super early because my mom was actually a, uh, performer she was like a nightclub singer and uh funnily enough a hawaiian dancer she may have done some shows while i was in the womb so i feel like i kind of came out um you know with sort of uh rhythm and dance she was a dance teacher as well um you know, a love of melodies and catchy lyrics. And um, like my very first memory, I guess, would probably be my parents singing to me when I'm in the crib. And they were, you know, my dad was not musical in any way, but, um, you know, they used to sort of hover over the crib and sing good night songs to me. And my grandmother used to sing to me. And um, I had three older brothers. So, they all had extremely different tastes in music. So I was raised in a household with, um, you know, one brother was really into classic rock. One brother was more into art rock, like talking heads and, and jazz, like Miles Davis. And um, the other brother was really into ska and eventually got really into reggae and dance hall. And um, so my mom was very into Broadway musicals and she was a dance teacher. So she liked anything with, you know, that was kind of upbeat. She was actually a tap dance teacher. So um, I grew up listening to a lot of like, you know, sweet Georgia Brown. <laughs> like, um, she'd do these like exercises and routines to certain songs every year. And um, my dad was more of like a big band swing guy. Holy smokes. What a great cross section of music that you had from, from all, uh, everybody that was in your house. That's incredible. I just had my parents basically listening to Roger Whitaker and my brother listening to Emerson Lake and Palmer. And that was sort of the, the two extremes that I had growing up. Oh, right. That's amazing. So, it, well, it, I mean, you know, when you're in a big family, you, it, I don't know, you just get exposed to um, lots of different things and we all had extremely different tastes, you know? Yeah, and when you have multiple siblings, then it's 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 incredible. Just the 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 palette is is, is spread very very wide. Were there mm -hmm. any instruments that were in your house at all, or was it was it just literally people listening to records? We had a piano, and we all uh, my mom insisted we all take piano lessons, and um, she learned piano, I guess, at a young age. I mean, she also sang in, a, in her choir, I guess, is where she started singing um, when she was a kid. So uh, she really wanted us all to go to the conservatory and study piano, which we all did. And I remember her chasing one of my brothers around because uh, he would never wanted to practice. And she had this like wooden clog that she would sometimes throw at him and <laughs> she'd get really mad because he never wanted to practice. But I really enjoyed piano. I, I stuck with it for a while, but it was, it was um, not really what I wanted to do. It was classical and everything was by rote. And I think if I had had a different approach or teacher, uh, I learned later in life um, when I, my drum teacher suggested that I study with a jazz pianist here in, in Toronto, uh, that the approach would have been probably a lot more my style, like more leaning towards improvisation and learning chord progressions. Interesting. So you went from piano to drums. Are those the two instruments that you play or do you play anything else? Uh, you know, I'm a hack at everything. I, I play a little bit of uh, guitar and bass, just like campfire chords and stuff. But um yeah, drums, I really just fell into by accident. Uh, a friend of mine, I actually was singing in bands. I moved to Montreal uh, to go to university and I was, uh, that's really where I started playing in bands. And I answered an ad to sing in a band called High Yellow. And, and every time I would go to the jam space, I would kind of sit behind the kit and, you know, waiting for other members to roll in late. I would just kind of teach myself beats. And uh, a friend of mine, Cecil Castellucci, um, Cecil Seaskull, as she was known back then, um, was going on tour with her band called Nerdy Girl. And she said, oh, my my drummer just dropped out and I have to go on this tour. Can you sit in? And I was like, sit in on drums? <laughs> and she was like, yeah. 
I was like, you know, I'm not a drummer and I don't own a kit, right? She's like, oh, but you'll be fine. You'll be fine. The songs are really easy. So uh, that's how I got roped into drumming. That's so amazing. It's interesting as a drummer, like you really don't have to be that flashy on drums. It's really just right? like I always, when I look for a drummer, I'm looking for somebody that can really just keep a, a solid eighth note groove. If you can do that, then that is like, that's money. It's not about how fast can you play, how quickly can you play the, the tom fills and things like that. If you right, can really I mean, find a great pocket and just really serve the song. Yeah, depending on the genre, like I I had really good rhythm and um and good feel, I think, you know, which was the key. And I had a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of passion. <laughs> so cool. So okay, you move to Montreal, you start playing with bands. Uh, how does that eventually lead you to being a Juno nominated artist? Can you tell me mm. a little bit of the story of that? So, uh, I played in a band called Bodega. We were a trio and we got a record deal. We got signed out of New York to London slash records and, um, our debut album called, I think it was just self-titled called Bodega was nominated for best alternative album of the year. And we were we went to the Junos. I'm trying to remember where it was that year. Hamilton, maybe. And um, it was fun. You know, we were just indie rock kids, but we got to go in a limo to the arena and then sit in the audience with, uh, you know, Maestro Fresh West and people that I, I think Celine Dion might have been hosting it that year. It was just kind of like, wow, what's going on? And um and we lost, unfortunately, but we lost to a good friend of ours named Rufus Wainwright. So that's, that was that's okay. all right. That's all right. Fine. And he uh, he graciously invited us back to his hotel room and we drank champagne all night. And, you know, we were kind of mad at him for beating us, but we were also like, that's a really good album. What are you going to do? Right. Right. Oh, but just even just to be nominated is incredible if you think about how many acts that are out there how many artists how many bands and and just you're you're what one of five that got nominated for that award for that year that's amazing it is pretty amazing i think when you when you're coming out of the gate you don't necessarily realize how awesome and rare it is you just kind of think hey maybe this is what my life's going to be like from now on you know just winning awards and stuff and <laughs> and then uh two albums later the record label dropped us and that oh, was no. that Oh no. Oh no. Yeah. Okay. Well, the, it unfortunately happens quite a lot, doesn't it? Oh, in yeah. the industry. Yeah. I know. It's it's kind of like uh that that thing, you know, uh where they say if you're unhappy about the weather, just wait 5 minutes and everything will change. You know, especially here in Canada, but it's just it's the same thing in the music industry. If you think that something's great and it's going on, as Tom Hanks said uh in a in an interview that I heard uh, recently, he's going on and on talking about how this too shall pass whatever you have going on right now, this too shall pass. That's right. Yeah. And so it did pass and you, rather than leaving the music industry, you continued onwards. And uh, I, I would love to know how you went from being in a Juno nominated band to being where you are today with all of the things that you're doing. I don't know when you ever sleep, you're doing so much. But just uh, <laughs> if you could take me through uh, that, that journey, that would be amazing. Please. And thank you. Um, sure. Well, so while I was living in Montreal, I was also working in film and television. So on the production side. And um, so our band relocated to try, I came back to Toronto, which is where I'm originally from, but we moved from Montreal to Toronto. And um, after the band imploded, I ended up working on a little show called Canadian Idol in the music clearances department. Um, my production experience came in really handy and my knowledge of music. So that's where I learned all of my uh, chops in terms of understanding sync licensing. And I also ended up working with a film and TV composer named Marty Simon, who um, was composing on a really big show that did huge numbers in Germany. And so he was composing. I was in his office, I was sending the music cue sheets and the tapes uh, every week to try to get them in and on deadline. And then um, he started tracking his own royalties around the world and figuring out, hey, wait a minute, I'm missing all this money and uh, started, you know, going in with that key and unlocking the secret coffers of uh, the black box of music publishing and 
Um, he figured out a lot of things about how to do that and sort of taught me along the way and then started doing it for other composers like Michael Dana and some very high profile um, LA composers. And so I was, he was a drummer. That's how he started. And then he became a composer and I was still drumming after I left Bodega. I started sort of freelancing and I would, I was sort of a gun for hire. I did a European tour with the hidden cameras and played with various, you know, um, performers like Gavin Creel out of New York and um, just kind of did some cruise ships. I was just doing some random touring gigs and uh, also working with Marty. And he, because he was a drummer, he was extremely supportive. He was like, yeah, yeah, if you want to go do like a three week tour, go, I'll, I'll be fine. And then come back and keep working with me. Oh, so, um, yeah, he was an amazing mentor. Uh, it's really hard to find bosses like that, I think, who get like, okay, well, this is your job, but you also have a life outside of this. And I get that you want to be creative. So let me support both of your dreams and also give you a steady paycheck, which was uh, phenomenal at the time. And then um, what happened after that? I, I took a little break from everything. I stopped touring. I got married. I had a couple of kids, moved around a bit from Stratford to LA. And um, when I got back into town in Toronto, my kids were almost school age. And I was like, I want to go, go back to work part time. But you know, I, what am I going to do now? Like I can't do production hours. That's crazy. So um, a friend of mine actually said, Hey, there's this record label called six shooter and they're looking for an artist bookkeeper. Um, you know, I know you're looking for part-time work. I don't know if that's the kind of work you want to do. And I was like, oh, that, that could be great. This is perfect. And I applied for that job. I got it. I was the artist bookkeeper for about, you know, five minutes. And then they figured out that I had a background in publishing. And so Shauna Descartier and Helen Britton were like, stop the presses. We're going to make, make you the head of our publishing division. We're officially launching a publishing division and you can be the head of sync and licensing. Wow. And, um, yeah, so that's how that started. But I was still, I was still sort of moonlighting, doing production. You know, it's hard to make enough money uh, in the music industry. You kind of have to, I, I think I'm kind of the queen of wearing many hats, but I know everybody, you know, lots of my colleagues do the same thing. You kind of uh, have to take all the skills you have and apply them in different areas to kind of put together a full living to support your family. And um so I ended up becoming the publisher at Six Shooter. And then I ended up meeting Margaret McGuffin, who is now the CEO of Music Publishers Canada, because a friend of mine said, you should really join this association if you're going to be the publisher at Six Shooter. And in a conversation I had with Margaret, she actually said, oh, you were put as a reference on someone's job application to work at MPC. And I said, oh, really? Who is it? And what was the, what's the job that you're trying to fill? And she said, well, it's, it involves uh, membership and programming. And I said, well, how, how many hours would that job be? And she said, well, I don't know, actually. Like, why? And I said, well, maybe I could do that job, too. And she was, I said, I'm only part-time at Six Shooter, and maybe I could do part-time at the Trade Association. And it was, you know, really just me hustling and trying to like make ends meet and trying to, you know, do things that I found exciting and new because I like having variety in my life. So, so it really took, um, it took a meeting with Margaret and Shauna and myself to discuss like, what's this going to look like? Can we share Kim? Is that going to work? And uh, we figured it out and it's been great ever since. And they are like two of the most kick-ass mentors, badass boss bitches that you know I could ever learn from. So uh, I feel so lucky. Oh, absolutely. I love just your story of how you went from point A to point B is incredible. But I love the fact that you have this musical background that really probably informs you of, of a lot of the decisions that you make now because you remember what it was like to be at a certain stage in your musical career and you you work with a lot of people that are at that stage right now and i'm sure that you can help them out in so many ways that that you know are very very different than somebody who didn't have that background that you do 
For sure. I mean, it really makes a difference, I think, um, to start as an artist who has earned royalties and you you know the different revenue streams that you can uh, make a living off of. And that made me extremely passionate about uh, lobbying for fair compensation for artists. And when I, um, when I was applying for my job at Six Shooter, I remember... Shauna and Helen were interviewing me and they said, why do you want this job? And I said, well, I just feel very strongly about artists making a fair living. And, and um, you know, I want artists to be able to buy houses and pay mortgages and like live a real life and, and not have to be worried all the time that, um, you know, they have to work three other jobs while they're trying to create and tour and do all the things that an artist has to do. Mm-hmm. And they were like, you're hired. We love that. So, I, I do think it really helps that I started in on the artist side and it helps that I, you know, graduated to the sync licensing and publishing side. And then I also think it helps that um, I can bring a creative lens to what we do at the trade association. Like, um, you know, I can help program international song camps and I can help curate what that would look like and, You know, I know a little bit about, I know enough about the gear and what people need that I can, you know, speak the language, but I'm by no means a a producer or songwriter, you know. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. I I teach uh, songwriting at at Harris Institute in Toronto, and there's a lot of students that, you know, I I could see it on their face that they're kind of like, you know, uh, I don't really want to be here. I'm, I'm, I'm here at Harris for other things, not songwriting. But my whole argument is that if you know like a little bit about what goes into making a song and and what a life of a songwriter is like, you can't have a music industry without the song. So it's just, I I think it's an important aspect to just have a little bit of background like that in order to bring it forward to whatever it is that you're going to do career wise in the music industry. Just, just knowing those different things just helps inform you of all the decisions that you're going to, going to make going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Like just learn it all, you know, learn is even if you're just scratching the surface of, uh, you know, different areas of the discipline. It's going to help with your communication with people that you work with. It's going to help when you're trying to present your ideas. It's going to help when you're trying to, um, you know, explain your dream of where you want to go. I mean, I I really think emerging songwriters, um, you know, I work mostly with artists as opposed to non-performing songwriters, but obviously at the association, um, a lot of the publishers represent professional songwriters like yourself. So non-touring, you know, um, non-performing songwriters and composers make up such a huge percentage of, you know, the income and the revenue that SOCAN receives. So uh, I feel like that is an often overlooked um, area of the music industry is just, you know, when we talk about people thinking about options of what they can do, it's like everybody wants to be an artist to start. But then I always encourage artists to think about uh, other ways and of making passive income, ancillary income. You know, what could you be doing when you're not working on your next album or touring or, you know, you're, you're on a down cycle, but you still want to keep creating. And I'm like, songwriting is it, it's a muscle like you should just keep using it every day if you can, you know, the way a writer would be very disciplined about writing every day or a runner um, or a painter, you know, just, just keep working on your craft. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I love just what you're saying, how every day is an opportunity where you could actually learn something about the music industry. If that's what you really want to get into, why not you know, I'm, I'm definitely guilty of this, that I know a very, very small portion of the music industry. And that's part of the reason why I'm doing this podcast is to learn a lot more of, of how the entire music industry works. But just every day really is an opportunity to just take 15 minutes out and, and try to educate yourself on some other aspect of the music industry that that could actually help you out down the road. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I often say to people um, when I talk about my journey, you know, I didn't I didn't decide when I was in grade four, you know, I want to be a music publisher the way you might be like, I want to be a firefighter or a teacher or something. You know, I didn't even know what a music publisher was until, you know, much later in my life. So, so like, you got to stay open. You've got to learn as much as you can and 
even if you take a job thinking, eh, this is just the way I'm going to make money while I work on my creative things. Like sometimes what you're learning on your job actually takes you down another path and you realize, you know, this is happening to me right now. I just sort of, I'm a little sponge and I just picked up all these little bits and pieces from different areas of the industry, film and television and music. And now they're combining in such a perfect combination for what I, what I love to do. And, um, I'm now being called upon, you know, to do panels and be an expert in things. And I'm like, what? I'm like, I'm not old enough to do that. Am I like, am I now an expert? But I guess, you know, you do something long enough, uh, and you just sort of gather information along the way. Uh, I, you know, now when I look back, you know, you kind of ask me to put together a bio and I'm like, oh yeah, I have done a lot. Actually, <laughs> I have done a lot of things and I've worn many hats. So I guess I can speak to a lot of things in the industry. Well, I think there's two things going on with you. You have so much knowledge inside that head of yours, but you also present it in such a way that it's easily digestible to everybody. You know, like even just now in this podcast, what, what you're talking about could be very complicated in, in, in the way that you could explain it, but you're delivering it in such a way that I get it. I completely understand. And that's why I think you're being asked to be on all these panels is because you're, you're a great human being. You have a ton of information and you present it in such a great way that just everyone just walks away inspired and, and ready to rock after they hear you speak. Wow. <laughs> I don't know what to say to that, but thank you. That's true. It's true. It's <laughs> totally true. Uh, I've always felt that way about you. Just, you know, there's, uh, I, I always tell people I, I love astrophysics so much. I, I, that's my second love after music. Well, of course, I love my family as well. But, um, you know, I would have a really hard time listening to or reading you know, Stephen Hawking, for example. It's just it goes really deep and it gets very technical. But when I hear someone like Neil deGrasse Tyson speak, uh, I just really get it. And, and it, it inspires me and I want to learn more because he just really just like brings it down and tells you in this really nice way that is just easily understood. And I feel the exact same way about the way that you present everything and the way that you, you talk about the music industry. And, and you also present it with such joy and enthusiasm that, you know, it's, it doesn't seem like anything that you were saying is a drag in any sort of way. It's just, it's, <laughs> it's all positive. And it's just like, you can, you can be a part of this too. And I, I love that about you, Kim. It's great. Great to hear you. Wow. Um, Thanks. Oh, pleasure. Pleasure. Let me ask you about the women, uh, in the studio project. Uh, I've been blessed to be a part of that uh, as a, as a mentor. My involvement is just so little, but can you tell me when that started, what, what the inspiration was? Uh, just take me through the, the story of that, please. For sure. Um, we're just going into our fifth year. So we just welcomed our fifth cohort of six producers from across the country. So it is a program that, uh, our CEO, Margaret McGuffin at Music Publishers Canada conceived in five years ago because there was a study that came out of the University of Southern California called the Annenberg Study, which um, gathered data and showed that, uh, I hope I'm going to get the stat right, but out of the top 100 Billboard uh, songs, 2% of the producers were female identifying. And there was a very similar study in the film industry. I think it was, um, you know, 2% of the Oscar nominated films or winners uh, were directed by female identifying directors. So um, Margaret came to me and said, you know, I, I really want to do something about this. Like, what could we do as part of our corporate governance to, to try to move the needle forward a bit? And, and actually, I'm curious to know uh, why, why the numbers are so small. And is it because there really aren't any female, you know, I hear this all the time. In the music industry, I've heard people say like, well, I would hire a female producer if there were any, there just don't seem to be any out there. And so, the challenge was, you know, to see how many uh, producers existed and identified, I guess, as producers. So we started with a pilot project. We got funding for Ontario and five producers to be in the first cohort. And we just sent out a call for submissions. We were like, if you are a female identifying non-binary or gender fluid producer who would be interested in participating in a pilot project where we will provide 
workshops and mentorship and sort of give, try to give you, you know, entrepreneurial skills and a 360 of the industry and networking opportunities, um, please apply here. And we had a pretty good number of people come. I think there were about 40 applications in the first year in Ontario alone and, and not just in Toronto, like scattered all over. And we kind of realized, um, you know, a lot of, these producers were self-produced, self-producing artists. Some of them lived in very remote places. So they were just like writing in GarageBand or, you know, Logic and uh, Ableton or, you know, Fruity Loops. Everybody was working in different DAWs and were maybe a little bit reticent to call themselves producers, but our program is for producer songwriters. And so we were, we, we did the first year of programming in person and uh, our sponsors loved it so much. They were like, this program is awesome. We want to expand it. Let, can, can we please give you more money? And we were like, yes, let's make it a national accelerator. Uh, and then we really got to see, you know, once, once it was a national call for submissions, we were like, okay, we call bullshit on the fact that people think there are no female identifying producers out there. There are clearly, you know, we got over a hundred applications this year. So um, during the pandemic, we had to go virtual only, which was actually really interesting because we got to have amazing mentors like yourself, but also people from far away, like uh, Sylvia Massey and uh, Dr. Susan Rogers, and we had uh, Linda Perry one year. Um, going virtual kind of opened it up for us, and we got to bring in some amazing people who we hadn't met before. We started working with a uh, professor named Dr. Amandine Pra, who's a professor of audio engineering and um, she's like a tone meister. I don't know if you know what that means. She studied in Germany and got some kind of like degree or certificate in audio production, which means you get to call yourself a tone meister, which is so cool. So one of the most rewarding things about the program is being able to bring back the graduates from the earlier cohorts, and they are now mentors in the program. And they are also, uh, you know, going out into the world and going to song camps as producers and um, doing co-writes in other territories. And we are there to support them as well. So it's so it's not like you ever really leave the program once you become part of the community. Uh, you know, we're our hope is that everybody just kind of becomes one big family and keeps working together and supporting each other. That's amazing. That's amazing. such a success story. I love it. I love that this is happening. Is it my dream? Really, uh, you know, I want to see studios in the future that are completely female-run. Those that identify as female, you know, all oh. where it's just like that exists. Where all the engineers, all the people running the studio, any uh, gophers running and grabbing coffee, whatever is just. You know, I would love that so much. I remember listening to a Tegan and Sarah record that came out uh, maybe about three years ago. Um, and everybody that worked on that record was female. And I just, mm -hmm. I love that so much. I love that. And I just, I wish for more things to be happening like this. And I'm just, I'm curious about, about this program, the women in the studio program. Do you have any, uh, examples of just some really good success stories that have come out of this? Well, yeah, actually I love, I love this utopian vision that you have because I have the same one because I was always the only woman in the studio whenever I went in to record and it was pretty alienating and very man cave like. But two of our success stories have been Isabel Banos in Montreal, who plays in a band called Cave Boy and Sarah McDougall, who lives in London, Ontario. They both opened their own studios after they graduated from the program and uh you know, it's cool. Like I follow their progress on socials and it's super interesting to see how uh, different their studio spaces feel compared to, you know, certain places that I've been. I mean, I'm, I've been to some amazing studios. They're beautiful and very, you know, um, high end, but the vibe in, in these studios is very like, very much like, I want you to feel safe. I want you, I want you to think about your health and wellness. Here's a yoga mat. <laughs> Do you want to meditate before we start our session? You know, it's got like beautiful flowers and candles and like very soft tones and, and just sort of like cozy couches, not like the cold, 
leather. <laughs> anyway, um, it's it's to me really exciting to see how um, you can reimagine what is what the studio experience can be. And it doesn't just have to be women or female identifying producers who do this. I'm sure there are lots of men who are doing this as well. It's just, it's just really refreshing for me to see that, um, you know, somebody explained to me that they went into, I think it was Isabel's studio just to do some vocals. And, you know, it was like, do you want to just be completely alone and we'll turn off the lights and we'll, and sometimes when you're a woman and you're, you know, in the past, you did, you wouldn't necessarily feel totally safe you know, late at night, you're the only woman there. People have been drinking, you know, there's sometimes uh, you, you do feel um, sort of not ill at ease or like, oh, I, I really have to watch my step here. I don't want to do it. I don't, if anything inappropriate happens, I don't want it to be, you know, blamed on me or whatever. And I just think it would be so freeing yes. to be in an all female space and just be like, not to say that there won't be, you know, sexual misconduct and there's, there could still be power dynamics that are unhealthy, but I think the chances are a lot less, a lot less, a lot less. You know, I have a young daughter and I, I would love for her to follow whatever dream she wants to follow. And uh, just to think that, you know, if you had the possibility of, of entering into what it is that is your dream, but then to receive some sort of terrible thing like that, you know, where you go into a studio and you, you feel threatened or you, you feel unsafe in any sort of way like that is no way to, to live your dream. That is no way at all. And I, I just, I, I want these situations to exist. I want the, it, it to be so that anybody can go into a studio and just feel like I'm there because I'm there for the music. I'm there because we could be creative together and we can create some really great things. And if you create a space that just welcomes that, and make somebody feel really good, then it is truly all about the music and you can really create the best art possible and, and not have to worry about the other crap that goes on in so many different situations. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. I feel so inspired talking to you. It's just, <laughs> I, I want this future now so badly, so badly, but it's I know coming. it's coming. It is it's coming. coming. It's already happening. I love it. I love it. Okay. That's great. I know you have very limited, limited time. So I'll just ask you a couple more questions if that's okay. Sure. And I appreciate your time so much. Um, what can you say has been one of the best things that's happened to you in your career? What's been one thing where you just say, my goodness, this has been incredible. This has made it all worth it. Mm, that's a good question. It doesn't have to be the only thing. It can be just the first thing that pops to your mind. Well, I mean, it really is the women in the studio program. That is, it. it's really my passion project and it is, it is something that I do, you know, not because it's my job and I have to do it. It's just something that I really strongly identify with and feel passionate about. And I'm very emotionally in, invested in it because I wish it had been different for me when I was coming up. And I just think we are, like you just said, we're creating a new normal and we're creating a safe environment. And, you know, I have amazing, um, an amazing steering committee that helps with that program. Um, Vivian Barkley from Warner Chapel and Cheryl Link at Peer Music, Michelle Pack at Sony, who actually brought you in, which was amazing. And I I look at all those three women and I and I know they've been through similar things to me. You know, we're we're an older generation and and for one reason or another, we steered away from what we originally thought we were going to do in the music industry because, you know, hostile environment or lack of mentors, or we felt discouraged along the way, but um, somehow managed to parlay into having, you know, successful careers in the music industry where now we can actually support and encourage young women coming up. It's so rewarding. Love it. Uh, last question to you, um, and I know people get asked this all the time, but I think it's an important question for sure. What would you say to the next generation of young females or those that are identifying as female? Uh, what mm -hmm. would you say to them uh, if they're thinking about a career in music? Is there any advice that you would give? My God, there's so much. <laughs> I know. How much time do we have? <laughs> yeah, I'll try to. I'll try to pick one thing. Um, I really do feel like 
owning the means of production is extremely important. So to, to be self-sufficient and not necessarily relying on someone else to make your art, uh, you know, is it's sort of a luxury that other artists have like visual artists or um, comedians or writers. Uh, but, you know, music really can be, and in my, in a perfect world, to me, it's very collaborative and you're, you should be co-writing, you know, don't just, don't just do the same thing over and over again. Even if you're, you feel your songwriting is quite evolved, always stay open to writing with other people. Uh, but also try to learn the skills that you need to just be able to record yourself at home yeah. and, and learn the gear. You don't have to be an expert in it, but learn the language, learn as much as you can. Um, there's so much available now on YouTube and, you know, you can do research, but also um, find a collaborator to work with. Like I find having a business partner, business partners who are women is really cool. Like you might be an amazing songwriter who gets sent into all kinds of high level writing rooms, but if you have to go by yourself as a woman, sometimes it kind of sucks. So I just met this amazing writing duo, actually, um, Good Grief. And they were talking about how they were both top lining and doing co-writing as separate entities. And then they ended up doing a co-write together and felt they really complimented each other. And they were like, let's just start, let's be a songwriting team and we'll just go in and write with other people together. And I do feel like there's safety in numbers. And I do feel like, um, you know, having an ally and somebody that you trust and somebody that you work well with to be your sidekick and your, you know, champion is really, it's a really good thing to do. I feel like that was too much advice, too many points, but <laughs> oh, it's, it's, I'll take it all. I'll take it all. I'm, I'm sure you've got a million more points that you could give as well. And maybe we'll do a part two of just the advice that you would give. That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Kim, this has been great. I, I can't thank you enough for, for the time that you've had uh, to share with us and, and the great answers that you've given us and, and uh, all that you do in the music industry for, for everyone, and but especially for the Women in the Studio project that is happening. I think it's incredible. And I more of that, please. More people like you, please, oh. in this world. Please, thank you. thank you for supporting that program. And please continue to come and help us out because it's amazing to just have incredible mentors like yourself who are willing to donate their time and, and be there for this younger generation that's just coming up and trying to learn. So I am yours to use and abuse as much as you want. <laughs> I, I, absolutely. We got that. We have that recorded, right? That's right. That's right. I'll give it to you in writing too, if you want. Awesome. That's great. Kim, thank you so much uh, from the bottom of my heart. I really appreciate you, you being here and, and uh, being a part of this uh, podcast. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks, Rob. Okay. We'll talk Later. to you soon. Stay tuned for the next episode of Women in the Music Industry coming soon. Let's embark on this incredible journey together, celebrating the women who are reshaping the music business one note at a time. If you enjoyed hearing this podcast, please take a moment and give it a like, a rating, or a follow. Your support helps immensely. We'll see you next time.